Hi everyone, Kelly here, and today I want to talk about all the books I read in the second half of September. I did do a mid-September wrap-up, so I'll link that down below. So these are the things I finished in the last half of the month, and mostly they are sequels, or part of a series. A couple were the first in the series, and that's what I was focused on in September, was reading series, continuing series, picking up new ones that I wanted to try. And then the second half at the end will be books that I read with my daughter as part of our study of the Golden Age of Islam. And so some of those would be ones that I still recommend for adults and then some that would be really good for young kids to read aloud and learn more about, you know, a different culture and all that. So let's go through. I'm going to start with the ones that I read just for me. So I'm still continuing to read Witch Hat Atelier by Kamome Shirahama. And this I read volume four. This is a manga with just beautiful, beautiful drawings. So I just wanted to show you some of the artwork. This is kind of like an in-between chapter page, so it doesn't have to do with the plot. Um, yeah, but you can see that it's just absolutely beautiful artwork. And this is just about a girl who wants to be a witch and just kind of a whole like view into this world and what witches do in this world and how they create their magic. And it's just really stunningly drawn. And I've been really enjoying the characters and getting to know how the magic works. This one was one of my not so favorite ones. Like it was still good. I still give it three stars, but it was, it felt like a bridge book to me. You know, when you have a long series, sometimes you have ones that don't have a lot happening. And the reason this one is it's all like in one like event is happening in this book. And so it just, it wasn't like my favorite of the series, but I'm sure it introduced some important things that will make the next one even more exciting. But in general, I'm really enjoying reading this. And even when it's not like the best plot in a volume, it's still beautiful to look at. And then I finished a duology. This is a collection of both the first and the second book in The Legend of Skeleton Man by Joseph Bruchuk. And this one, you know, it's like the first book is called Skeleton Man. The second book is The Return of the Skeleton Man. And then it's got printed in this bind up of the two. And my favorite thing about this was actually his introduction. He does his um, author's note at the very beginning. And he's basically talking about why as a um, Native American writer, he chose to write scary middle grade books, like books meant for kids that are scary, and how that's a tradition in you know, his culture that um, they tell these stories in order not just to frighten, but to teach lessons and all that and teach like how bravery and courage and like calm being calm in the in the moment of um, normal panic, how that helps you get through situations. And I really like that. He also talks about why he chose to make the main character a girl that he could have, you know, written it from a boy's point of view, but that he's talking about how um, in Native cultures, strong female characters are very common and that they really listen to the women in their family. And it's just like a theme that the Native American stories have brave female protagonists. And so I just really enjoyed that author's note. So if you're going to pick this up, even if you don't pick up the bind up, I would suggest like finding one that has an author's note with it because I do really like it. It was my favorite part of the whole story was just kind of hearing why he chose to do this. And basically, this is a story about a girl named Molly, who in the very beginning of the first book, her parents go missing, like they don't come home. And she just is like trying to figure out what to do. And after a while, obviously, she goes into child services, since she's all alone. And then a man comes to child services saying that he's her uncle and takes her home with him. But she's never met this man. She didn't know she had an uncle, like, because her family doesn't have it. Like, her parents didn't have any other family. Um, but he convinced through, like, paperwork and stuff that he was her uncle. But she feels like there's something sinister going on. And this first book was perfect. So, like, I gave this whole bind up four stars. But if I was just reading the first book, Skeleton Man, it was a five stars. Absolutely perfect spooky middle grade book. It's exactly what I want when I read a middle grade horror where one, I love, you know, the strong female protagonist that um, uses things like her, you know, her parents have taught her to think before she acts and all that. And so she uses that in order to outwit, you know, the bad guy and all that. So like, I like the way that he portrays the female protagonist. But then I also think he does an amazing job of making the whole first book ominous. Like, even when nothing is happening, like, you know, there is, like, 
stuff that it builds towards. But like for a lot of the story, it's, you know, it's building that ominous, uncomfortable feeling before like the climax. But the whole time I was like unsettled and was like trying to figure out, is this like, um, like a, like, or is this guy actually a bad guy? Is he supernatural? Like, you know, all that stuff. Like it was like, uh, you know, it's like the definition of like on the seat, you know, edge of your seat kind of thing. Perfect writing. So I would actually really highly recommend just reading Skeleton Man. I did not really love the sequel. I would have given the sequel three stars. So that's why I gave the whole combination four stars. But I can't like say enough how good the first book is. But the second book just didn't have that ominous feeling. I think it was like, it had some new themes that he was putting in. And, you know, Molly is dealing with the PTSD from, like, the first story. So we kind of deal with that, like, working through past trauma while still, like, having, you know, things that are happening that she has to, like, work through. Um, you know, combining those two. I like that theme, but it did not have that. It was it was not scary during most of it. Like, it built up to scary thing, but there wasn't this ominous feeling the whole time. Like, the first book was just, I almost couldn't put it down because it just had that ominous feeling all the way throughout so I would highly recommend the first one but you know the second one's not bad or anything it just was a little bit of a letdown after how amazing that first half was so I would definitely highly recommend the first one and they're each only like 115 pages so I would still recommend the first book a lot and then I started a new series and I'm actually not going to continue it um I picked up Bait and Witch by Angela M. Sanders this is a cozy mystery and in the past I haven't loved cozy mysteries because of some of the things, you know, like all cozy mysteries kind of have in common or a lot of them just don't make sense to me. And I get you're supposed to, you know, suspend, you know, your disbelief and all that. But I'm just like, I don't get it. And one of them is that whole thing where it seems like in a lot of cozy murder mysteries where somebody, just an average lay person, like not a cop, not a investigator, comes across a dead body and then like goes about their regular life. Like they are, you know, obviously invested in, in the like murder case and want to help solve it, but they still go <laughs> to work after. I'm sorry, if I found a dead body, I wouldn't be going to work that day and I would probably be going to therapy. Like, <laughs> I just can't imagine um, just happening upon a dead body and then like being like, well, now I'm gonna go to work. And <laughs> so like those kind of things, um, that's just one example of the kind of ridiculousness that I think are in cozy mysteries that just bother me personally and take me out of the story. I get that it's just a part of the genre that we're supposed to just go with the silliness and the kind of like wild wacky type thing but it just doesn't work for me and this was long that way. I thought I would try it because I thought if I was gonna like a cozy mystery this is about a woman who's a librarian and she's got something that has happened that makes it so she has to like flee and like so she runs off to this small town to be their small town librarian and kind of hide out. And while she's there, she realizes that she's a witch and kind of learning how to use her powers and learning about her powers. And then she also has a little cat companion. So I thought if I'm going to like a cozy mystery, it's going to be about a librarian who, you know, is becoming a witch and has a cat companion. Like what, what could be better? But I ended up just giving this three stars because mostly just because of the genre in general. Like, I don't think I've ever given a cozy mystery over three stars. Um, and it just is the same thing as always. It's that whole, like, casual finding of a dead body. Um, there's the whole, like, she wants to, you know, be part of the investigation, like any main character in a cozy mystery, but then, like, fixates on one person as, like, the killer or whatever. But there's not really any reason why she would think that other than just we need a red herring. And so, like, Yes, they do a couple like little shady things. And so then she's fixated that this person is the killer, even though everybody else is telling her that, that person is not the killer. And she just is like, no, but I think he's the killer. I'm like, like, stop. Like, there's no reason for you to think that. There's so many people that it could be. Um, yeah, so it's just like the genre just doesn't work for me. Sorry if, if it's like a, a comfort read for you. I'm happy I have my own comfort reads. I actually find like, spooky middle gray to be very comforting for me I kind of use this as my cozy mystery slot in my life but cozy mysteries themselves just don't work for me and then I read two books from the Chronicles of Narnia so The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and The Silver Chair I read this one with my daughter we listened to it together and then I listened to The Silver Chair by myself 
And um, yeah, I gave The Voyage of Dawn Treader three stars. So it's the one I've given the lowest so far. I really love The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when we read it together as a family. And I liked Prince Caspian. But this one, it's, it's mostly a travel book. And I think that's my problem. I'm not a huge fan of a travel book that has more like vignettes. I like it to have like an overall main point and yes there's kind of a main point but the main point is mostly just adventure they're on the boat and they're just exploring the islands beyond narnia um and that's just not enough plot for me and there were moments of this that were great there's like two different spots that were like five stars for me um i'll be very vague so i don't spoil for anybody but if you've read it there's a part with our main character eustace he's a cousin of the kids from the other the first couple books and um yes he's a very obnoxious character at the beginning but i like his character growth and how he comes about his character growth i really love that chapter and then there's a chapter where lucy the youngest of the pevency pevency children um how she kind of has to save a whole like village of people and i really liked that scene so those two chapters are like five stars but the rest of it was probably two stars because i was just bored and wasn't invested and just kind of the rambling travels. Yeah, three stars for me. I mean, I'm still glad that I read it, but just not my favorite in the series. And then the silver chair was four stars because I like this better. It does have traveling in it. It is a bit of a traveling book, but it has like a clear purpose. It's following Eustace, who is the boy from the Dawn Treader, and a school friend of his named Jill and they end up in Nar Narnia and have to go and save this missing person. And so they're looking for the missing person. They have a reason to be traveling from place to place. So it made more sense to me to be traveling. Also this is narrated, I don't know if all of them are narrated by a different person, but this is narrated by Jeremy Northam. Northam. Um, I'll put a picture of him here because you might recognize him as an actor and I thought he did an excellent job. He's not the same narrator that we listened to for this one and he really pulled me into the story and made me really enjoy it. I probably even more than reading it um, because I thought his narration was great. So if you're gonna listen to these I would suggest his narration because it was excellent. So those I you know I'm continuing on. I only have a few more. I'm reading in um publication order if you couldn't tell so that was these were three and four in publication order so now I go back I think to like the horse and his boy and magician's nephew before finishing off the last book in the chronological order and those are all the things I read like for myself so if you don't if you don't care about the things that I've read with my daughter you don't you can <laughs> stop watching now if you want but I really enjoyed all of these and you know some of them are I think good for adults too so Go ahead and continue watching if you want but basically we are studying like very slowly doing history um studying the middle ages and we're kind of like going by civilization or area of the world and so right now we are studying the golden age of islam we're still doing it but like this is what we finished this month for that topic and so for our like we always kind of do some folklore related to the area we are studying and so this time we read um the usborn illustrated arabian nights and this was, I gave this five stars. Um, this is definitely targeted towards a younger audience. Like I would say this is like a five to eight year old kind of audience. But I had a really fun time reading this with my daughter. So if you are somebody that really needs like when you're reading aloud to your kids, need something you're invested in as well. I found this a lot of fun to read. So it was a great time. It follows the like structure of Arabian Nights or Thousand and One Nights um, where we do have Scheherazade and she's telling the stories every night to her husband in order to stay alive but it is very gently introduced in this since it is for little kids so um it's not graphic in any way in the stories that are have a more violent theme there's no like graphic violence it might just say this person died but it doesn't give any details um which i think is important for like if you're going to read it to a young young audience but they were just really well really well written and fun to read and my daughter absolutely loved it and I really enjoyed reading with her. Um, this one has like Alibaba and um, Aladdin and Sinbad the Sailor and some more stories but those are kind of the most popular ones. And then we read a couple of very early chapter books like these are the kind of chapter books that um, 
have a lot of pictures so you can read it basically in one sitting and i wanted to you know while we're studying this history uh, like islamic history i wanted to read some books that are current day everyday like slice of life kind of books that involve characters that are muslims so that's why we read these and so we read sadiq and the desert star by simon nirali and Sadiq's family is from Somalia. They're Somali-American. And there is like a little thing in the beginning of the book that introduces his family and some Somali terms that are throughout, which I think is good for kids to like see how other families like, you know, in incorporate their language of origin and all that stuff in their everyday life. And just him going about a school trip to the, what is that called? where they, <laughs> the planetarium, I'm like, they look at stars and he wants to form a little astronomy club. So it does have some like science facts in it, but then also talks about just his everyday life. And then his dad tells him a little story um, that his father told him back in Somalia. So we have a little bit of culture too. So that one was really good. She enjoyed that one. And these are definitely targeted towards young kids. So this would be early elementary or even preschool age. Like this one, I would definitely even read to my preschooler. This is Meet Yasmin by Sadia Faruqi. And this main character is Pakistani American. And this is another just slice of life. I think she's a preschooler just based on the things she did at school. And it's just little like vignettes of what she does in her day-to-day -day life. But it does have like in the back some information about Pakistan and that you can like, t you know, talk to your kids and like a recipe for one of the drinks that the family has. And then there's also like some Urdu words and stuff like that. So I think it's good. These kind of books, just, you know, slice of life books, but with cultures that are different than our own, I think are good to read with kids. And so I would recommend those for an early elementary or preschool age kid. And then one of the nonfiction history books we read that I would definitely recommend for adults um, because actually it was over my daughter's head. This is The Genius of Islam, How Muslims Made the Modern World by Bryn Barnard. And this one, yes, it is like a small book, um, but it's a lot of text on the page. And so it took us actually a long time to read through this. And it has very high vocabulary words for my seven-year-old. This is probably over her head. But it like got across the point that I wanted to get to her that a lot of like innovations and things that we take for granted now were like invented by um, Muslims during the golden age of Islam. So like I mean, even things like reading books that like they used, they kind of innovated into like books instead of scrolls and like, you know, different things with surgery and um, medicine dealing with the eyes and all this kind of stuff originated during this golden age of Islam. And so I think as an adult, I learned a lot from this. And if you're going to read it with kids, I would suggest an older elementary or middle school audience because it was a little over my daughter's head, but it still got around the point. She gets what's going on at this time period. But um, I learned a lot as an adult. And that's it. We have been reading some other things, but I'll talk about them next month since we haven't finished them yet. Um, so if you want to talk about any of these books, I would love to hear from you down below and I'll see you next time. Bye.